introduce Kane Norton here. Kane has about 15 years experience across a bunch of different sectors including security, education and government. Uh, he's going to teach you a few tricks today using Leonard features to make our hacker's life hard. Now the presentation is aimed at arming sysadmins, devs and hobbyists with the collection of tools and techniques to thwart hackers post exploitation using common Linux features. You good to go? Cool, thank you very much. Fantastic to see an audience of this size for a uh, security thing at open source. Uh, I know it's been a big uh, thing for the last few years <coughs> in a lot of projects. Um, so yeah, oh, firstly, who I am. My name's Kane Norton. I started out my career here, in fact, in this building as a sysadmin. So I come from Solaris and Linux background. Uh, more recently, I started the security intelligence team at NAB, uh, basically how we dealt with hackers and cybercrime groups who were trying to target the bank and its customers. I spent four years in government working out how to try and stop Australians from getting infected. Probably not such a problem for all of you Linux users in the room, but definitely still a problem for the mums and dads on XP. And uh, more recently, I started my own company doing pen testing. Then I've gone into uh, business with a few other guys, forming a company called COSIV. We basically consult to organizations on how to better use their security tools and information. Realize there's a big gap. Everyone's buying new widgets and appliances, but no one's really working out how to better use the stuff that they've got. Um, considering this is linux.conf.au, I won't be talking about any of the Windows-y stuff. I could probably do another whole deck on stupid tricks for Windows to make people's lives hard. But uh, yeah, that's basically what we're all about. Um, why bother? <laughs> um, I think there's definitely a real problem in the way that most people approach security because they're trying to stop things. And stopping's a nice goal, but it's very difficult. What I try and do personally is I want to make it difficult. If I can waste the time of my opponent, if I can make them think they're doing something when they're not, if I can get them all pissed off, they're going to attack someone else instead of attacking me. It's just a far more effective use of my time. Um, most places you don't have an unlimited budget uh, and we tend to be very focused in security and where we're already invested. So here's some tricks just to sort of across the board, defend things that you don't normally bother defending using you know, relatively simple techniques. Um, but yeah, ultimately, remember that threat actors aren't a force of nature. It's not like you're trying to stop the ocean coming over you know, the isthmus or whatever. They're people just like you and me. If they find something annoying or difficult, I'm sure we've all had problems It's like, I'm not going to bother with that. I'll come back to that some other time. I'll go do something easier. You want to try and get the people who are attacking you to do the same thing. You're just not worth it. Just to sort of frame where we're attacking this from, I'll be talking a lot about Lockheed Martin's cyber kill chain. You notice it's really big and in red. That's because last time I spoke about this, I didn't have the giant tra uh, registered trademark sign. And a guy from Lockheed came over and said, uh, mate, you're gonna get in trouble with our lawyers. So yes, Lockheed Martin, fantastic defense contractor, hardly doing it. <laughs> I was gonna say something mean about them, but they actually do some pretty cool stuff as far as defense contractors go. Uh, the screenshot there's a, uh, about like a boss which is some open source malware investigation tools that they released, they're actually pretty slick. So yeah, I went to their website trying to say something mean about them and actually ended up feeling better about Lockheed Martin. Anyway, the cyber kill chain. It is derived from the old US military doctrines and I'll talk a little bit later how it doesn't fit, but it's very much a way to envision someone particularly a targeted attack. It comes from like the APT land, which is you know, basically a nice word for state-sponsored actors or alternatively some malware we haven't seen and we don't know what we're doing, depending on who you talk to. Um, <clears throat> so basically, it's a, I'll go through them, but it's a, it's a process of looking at how a compromise happens. The first step is always effectively reconnaissance. <clears throat> now, you need to gain information about an environment before you're going to attack it. Uh, typically, most people think of this as like oh, network scanning and stuff, and I'll be talking about ways of deceiving someone who's trying to look at your network, but do not overlook the influence of things like LinkedIn. I can typically get somewhere between 80 and 90% of the people in your company and their titles using some pretty clever LinkedIn searches. If you weren't aware of it, uh, you might have privacy controls in LinkedIn. Um, if you are a recruiter or a hiring manager or you just tell them you are, you can get bypass pretty much all of those controls. Also, the Google bot doesn't have privacy controls applied to it. So someone who to you will appear as, you know, person in this company, if you Google the other words in that, the Google bot will tell you the person's title. 
So yeah, think about reconnaissance. Think about putting fake people on LinkedIn for that matter. I'm getting ahead of myself. I'll talk about that in a moment. Weaponization. Weaponization is the phase where, you know, ultimately if you're going to do something to attack someone, you've got to sort of package up the payload. Uh, this would typically be like PDF, a doc, a zip, maybe just because the model doesn't fit that well, something like a SQL query, but not generally, I wouldn't say. Um, weaponization is very difficult to combat. Uh, the color coding of the backgrounds here is basically how screwed you are at the point that you're blocking it. If you're able to stop PDFs with like injectable code in them, then like there's no cost to you. It doesn't cost anything. When you're getting further down the kill chain, you're talking about bringing in like external teams and panicking and getting your media relations in. You want to try and get rid of stuff. You know, the the politer color the background. Delivery, uh, getting payloads into the environment, email, USB sticks in your car park, all of this sort of stuff. Uh, exploitation. It's basically just activating the payload. Everyone knows what exploitation is generally. Uh, it's a software vulnerability. It can also be a human double-clicking an attachment because they got a speeding fine from the AFP or whatever it is this week. Um, very easy to think of exploitation as being a technical thing, but quite often that's where user education is applied because it's a lot easier to just get someone to click a scary looking link or to open a file than it is to try and craft a zero day for you know, particularly modern versions of Adobe Acrobat. Installation, it's basically gaining a beachhead in the environment. It may be installing an executable, it might also be like making an account or coming up with some other way of getting your persistence inside the environment. Command and control, if you're at the point where you're blocking command and control, you know, as the angry color in the background indicates, this is gonna get expensive. Someone's installed something in your environment, they're at the point where they're trying to control that thing inside your environment. Uh, it could be anything from like Gmail uh, drafts, which is something you'll see in some state-sponsored attacks. They don't even necessarily have like a connection going out in a way that goes to anything that looks remotely criminal. They could just be using a common web service. They could be dropping files on Dropbox. They could be doing anything. Actions on objectives. Uh, this really depends on what the other party is after. And this is not necessarily what your... Most people think about their organization in terms of what they're concerned about. If you're a bank, you're thinking about money. If you're a activist group from Tunisia who's trying to fight the Australian government over censorship or something because you're part of Anonymous, maybe your objective is to make a bank look bad because of reasons. So you're wanting to just deface a website. So you've got to think about what the people going after you are trying to do, not necessarily what you think is important. And a bit of both, but think about other people's motivations. In terms of how realistic this is, um, there's, there's definitely nuance to it. Uh, quite interestingly, uh, earlier this week, late last week, Rob Joyce from the NSA, who I'm sure dear friends to everyone here, creators of SA Linux and various other cryptographic protocols, which is great of them. Um, the he is the guy who ran the tailored access team, which is basically the, the A team in terms of breaking stuff. Um, he said that in terms of their flow, they go for reconnaissance, initial exploitation, establish persistence, install tools, move laterally, and then collect, exfiltrate, and exploit the data. So it very much maps to this, but it's not a firm. Think of it as a guideline. You're not always going to have something that fits exactly into one of those things. It's like the you know, OSI layer for networking. You know, it might be like three and a half. It's not always layer three. Because this stuff comes from the military, they also have their way of dealing with things. The, the six Ds from the uh, US Army Information Operation Doctrine. Um, this is generally how we deal with stuff. I think this is a pretty good map, and this is, I guess, more what I wanted to get across in this presentation. Think about how we deal with things. Detect. Everyone understands detect. Detect is looking at your logs. Detect is having an IDS or an IPS or whatever. We detect stuff all the time. Usually we ignore it. It goes into a seam solution. We find out about it and go, damn, I wish we saw that after you realized you got hacked. Um, detect is good. Detect has no visible mechanism to an attacker. If you detect something, you know they're there. The other people don't necessarily know that you know, unless they hacked your seam, in which case you've got a whole other problem. Deny. Um, Deny is great and all. Deny is like a checkpoint. Deny is a, I mean, as in like physical, like that one there, not like the company. Deny is a firewall. 
IT security, unfortunately, due to just where the money is and where the money has always been, is a very popular means of dealing with things since the 1980s. Um, you know, if I rocket that, that checkpoint and they go, sorry, mate, no gingers allowed, I'm like, oh, damn. And then I go and dye my hair and I come back, I can walk right through again. It's like, yeah, I know why they blocked me. Uh, you know, if they just go, keep going, mate, and then they follow me for a while, then, you know, I don't know. So deny is very binary. You're denied or you're not. It's incredibly common. It's also incredibly easy to game. Uh, as a pen tester, I do red team exercises and things like that. And if, if I get an error message, sometimes I'll even get a message about what the rule is, which is awesome. <laughs> don't, don't expose that. I, I mean, we'll do if you're my customer and I'm doing the engagement, but I'm just going to tell you like, not to do that later. But yeah, it's awesome when you get like rule numbers. And I'm like, ooh, that's a different rule than the last one. Maybe if I just tweak my query. So yeah, deny. Super common, I'd like people to think about moving away from deny. Disrupt. Disrupt, we don't really see a lot of <laughs> in information security. Um, something like a DLP, data loss prevention tool, can do this. If you've got like, think about if you deployed your IDSs backwards and you blocked outgoing connections that had credit card data in them. That's the type of thing. It's pretty cool, um, it lets you find the business flaws in your environment. It's generally pretty sweet, but in cybersecurity, we don't see a whole lot of uh, Gumby's rejecting little basketballs. But yeah, it's a nice goal when you can do it. It's a way of, you know, it might also be, I don't know, if someone uploaded something, maybe you can delete it, but Australian law's not really so cool with that. Maybe if you're in Israel or other countries where they're a little bit more loosey-goosey in terms of uh, computer intrusion, it's okay. Degrade. I love, degrade's awesome. Like, what can you do to make the information no longer valuable to the guy at the other end or the girl at the other end? Um, well, firstly, just don't store it if you don't need it. I mean, everyone's like always like, log things, do all the logs. Don't do all the logs. I reckon probably 25% of the code reviews I do, people log things like the pins entered on a mobile phone device or other you know, like, it might only be, like, because someone put it in because something wasn't working at some point, but if you're running an Android phone, have a bit of a look at the log files stored on your file system. If you've got it rooted, you'll find all sorts of stuff that you probably wouldn't like stored. And every time you just click through and something says, I'd like access to SD card, please, and you're like, yeah, whatevs. Gives people the access to do that. So, yeah, don't keep stuff you don't need. Um, segment your data where you can. Use, like, don't just salt passwords. Also, pepper them. Um, so having something that, you know, is like on the file system, not in the database that you also combine to make the hash. It means even if someone steals all of your database, they don't have the extra missing piece, um, generally, unless they've exploited you to an even greater degree. Um, and use good password hashes. I've got a whole slide deck on that. But um, think about things like S-crypt, B-crypt, PBF, DS, whatever the shit it is, I can't remember. The marketing team for that one need to be fired. It's an awful name. <laughs> Um, yeah, Scrypt is good. Argon 2 is a new one. We don't quite know the state of that yet in terms of its security, but it won the password hashing competition. It's pretty cool. And more importantly, find out what hardware your people want to run this stuff on in prod and go and tune the algorithm. Pretty much anything that I would recommend using has like a tunable number of iterations. Pick the number of iterations that's right for you and your hardware. So somewhere between 200 and 500 milliseconds for most things to do a password hashing is probably about right. Your users won't see it, particularly if they're used to Australian internet speeds, a 200 millisecond delay. But it sucks if you're trying to crack passwords and it takes you 200 milliseconds, particularly something like Scrypt uses a lot of RAM. You can't easily offload it to a graphics card. And this is like a world of suck. This makes a hacker's life really hard. A um, good example for this stuff is LastPass. LastPass like store a bajillion um, iterations in the version that they have on your hard disk. And yeah, you're talking like tens of checks per second, not millions or you know, billions like you do MD5s. Deceive, I'm gonna be focusing mainly on Deceive for the rest of this presentation, so I won't cover off too much about what's about now. And Destroy. Destroy sweet. We don't really get much of a chance to do destroy. Um, I've worked for people who come from a military background and you can tell that like, you know, it's like, if only we had a team. But unfortunately, we don't really have a ballistic capability in most IT security companies. <laughs> Fortunately, that said, I mean, you know, you look at attribution in terms of a lot of security vendors and maybe it's probably for the best we don't have that. 
So he was coming from that building, and it's like, oh man, you just need Google. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, destroy is basically removing the opponent from the equation. It's really cool when you can do it. Usually something like law enforcement or legal systems that you can use against people. Um, yeah, it's awesome, but rare. Generally, when you're dealing with this stuff, uh, something like an action matrix is used. Think about what your problem is. Think about what the phases that someone would typically go through in order to conduct that type of attack. And then map your current defenses or defenses that you could have onto the action matrix. You know, you don't need a fancy tool. You can just use the, you know, open office spreadsheet stuff or Google spreadsheets if you're so inclined. And you'll realize that what you have now, for most people, if you're in a security, particularly a sort of uh, pre-existing security team, you're very sort of bottom left. Like, how do we detect things installed in the environment? Where's our antivirus and so on? You probably want to definitely move up the chart and maybe a bit more to the right. You know, what can you do? Like, just storing your passwords better costs you next to nothing, and it really gives you a lot more certainty, certainly a longer window to act within if there's a problem. Um, a word on destruction, and this is just because it's annoys the hell out of me. Sorry, I'm trying really hard not to swear. I hope I'm doing okay with that. Um, if everyone goes, you know what, we've got this plan, we're gonna smash these guys, we're gonna take all their infrastructure and burn it to the ground. Always go, okay, so what do we do then? Like, what's the next plan? You need to know whether you're being tactical or strategic if you're disrupting someone's activities. If you know where all of the servers are for the guys who are like doing the malware attack against your organization, like, what do you gain by getting them shut down? You're probably talking a couple of months effort to try and coordinate all, getting all the domain names and the servers and stuff pulled. And most of these guys cycle their stuff maybe every couple of weeks. You know, they've got to find, they outsource it. They've got a guy that's paying a couple of dollars a day to buy domain names for them. If you spend two weeks and you go, ha ha, we took all their domain names, press release everyone. And then they're like, huh, oh, click. And then they put them all back up again. It's costing you more than it's costing them. So know why you're doing it. Is it a strategic, is it tactical, or is it marketing because you're gonna have your IPO soon and you work for a security company? You gotta really know why you're doing this. Because if you know where they are, that's an advantage. You're just pushing them into a new lot of technology or you're pushing them into infrastructure you don't know about. Okay, so talking about some ways to mess with these things, I'm running, yeah, about right for time. Ways of messing with people who are doing reconnaissance against you, um, yeah. Put some fake people on LinkedIn with important sounding titles, maybe a payroll officer or something, because they'll get all sorts of emails from your CEO. Um, yeah, putting some, putting some little tasters out there isn't such a bad idea. Just don't impersonate real human beings. That's against the law. Um, network scans and uh, be, actually, yeah, there's another aside like, Google some of the table names and stuff, particularly if you run big enterprise stuff like Oracle. Um, I've seen stuff that would absolutely make your hair curl. Like look at Oracle forums and stuff for internal project names. I found some people asking for help doing uh, queries to put Swift data, which is international banking transactions, into Oracle databases and they're asking on Stack Exchange and it is not uncommon. So yeah. So I can wait, everyone pull out your laptops, look for the bad people in your organization. Or outsourcers, more often outsourcers. Someone's like, I can provide you five guys that can do that, they can be here on Monday. And they're like just stack exchanging like a mad bastard trying to work out how to do their job. Quite often with full table dumps and other data they shouldn't have, but anyway. Look at that. In terms of like, this is just like a, a, a dumb trick, but uh, yeah, everyone's seen a trace route, I think that's actually a trace path. That's what it looks like. Yeah, but what if it looked like that? Well, would that confuse the hell out of you if there was, you know, it's like, but he's, hang on, so I'm going towards the, but then it goes via the Kremlin, Facebook, and the White House, what? Um, so, not necessarily recommending you do this. Um, I actually found that this is surprisingly hard to do out of most data centers. If you've got your own pipes in Australia particularly, it's not too bad, but if you're like going, I'm gonna play with this on a VPS somewhere, um, DigitalOcean and pretty much everyone I tried, as if it's some really scummy providers in um, Amsterdam will stop you from forging outgoing packets that don't belong to their network, which is really cool. Uh, it's BCP38, I think, which is the standard that says like, 
you just shouldn't emit things that shouldn't be emitted. And I'm really pleased that my little demo thing didn't work because someone actually did something they were told to do in security for a change. I mean, it annoyed me, but I'm also pleased. <laughs> so, um, because I'm running a little bit uh, slow, I'll just talk. So yeah, um, basically there is a tool called Scappy. It can do really cool stuff like forging packets, grabbing packets. I'll come back to showing a demo of it at the end once I get through the other material, otherwise I'm gonna get tied up. But it can also produce really cool like pictorial versions of packets. So you can explain things to your managers and they can pretend they know what you're talking about. <laughs> Just if you need another page for a report and there's a packet involved, include a diagram of the packet, you know, it's now one page longer, it's awesome. Yeah, I'll come back to the scabby now at the end. Um, Shodan, the guy who runs Shodan, John, is a really cool dude. Shodan's like a search engine for what ports you accidentally <laughs> left open, like, you know, the telnet on a router that someone promised you was closed off, or, you know, maybe you thought it was internal facing, it's more like external facing. Um, Shodan's pretty cool, but a lot of people, it's a go-to for doing reconnaissance. Um, John, because he's a good guy, also has like dot .shodan.io as the reverse DNS for all of his stuff, like, I don't know. He's a nice guy and all, but feel free to lie to him, you know, just like redirect it somewhere else, close all the ports, open all the ports, serve him whatever crazy shit you want, like it's, you know, to, you're never going to have any legitimate traffic coming from Shodan, so you might as well, you know, I don't know, tell him you're running a nuclear reactor or whatever, you know. It'll just mess with someone who's trying to do reconnaissance on your environment the lazy way. A warning on this. Everyone knows about TCP, right? You're all familiar with TCP, how it works, you know, there's a SYN, there's a SYNAC and whatever. You would be surprised how many otherwise smart people on the internet go like, all right, I want to block port scans. So anyone who sends me more than 10 packets, like SYN packets, I'm going to block them. But that's not necessarily the guy messing with you. That's just some guy sent 10 packets from an address. Um, you can block access to all sorts of crazy stuff if you just forge packets from a particular host and someone's got some sort of rule here. Um, I was trying to think on, of a good way that I would like, uh, basically redirect Nmap stuff. And unfortunately, the indicators for Nmap traffic that used to be there, like the window size, they've got rid of in the recent versions. And I was looking for other people who might have done it. Um, and I found a lot of people doing really dangerous things with IP tables, so, yeah, like, don't do that. Uh, saw a talk recently where someone would block the entire Sash 16 when he did this, so he yeah. blocked the entire country that was servicing in, like, five minutes. Yeah, that would be a really effective way to not get attacked, though, to be fair. Like, <laughs> yeah. I, if your goal is to not get attacked, I absolutely encourage you to do this. If you've got some sort of continu continuity of service KPIs, I'd think twice. <laughs> Uh, in terms of weaponization, um, this is, let's see how this goes. This is a little uh, demo that I got one of the guys on my team to put together for me of the world's, this will be very familiar to anyone here who is a Python programmer. Oh crap, got this thing downloaded. Unexpected indent, that's not good. Well, you know, let's just go to that line and fix the thing. And this is not a fake script, this is a real script I got of ExploitDB. It's like, oh, okay, well we got some spaces and tabs in here, crap, all right, well, that's probably an accident, so uh, let's just put it back the way that it, ooh, just, geez, all over the place. Let's go, and we'll just make all of the tabs into spaces, like, you know, PEP8, this is the way Python's supposed to be. Just gonna replace that, boom, replaced, saved, done, let's run it. Uh, Crap, okay, line 52 this time. All right, what's happening on 52? Uh, okay, that's a bit weird. There's a, another line that's out a bit. I don't know what's going on here. This is annoying. Yeah. <laughs> oh, okay, so another unexpected indent. Yeah, this ain't good. Anyway, we wrote a Python interpreter that lies about bad indentation, missing files, and other random shit. <laughs> Like, yeah, and so eventually you get to get a point where you just go, you know what, I'm just so angry, I'm going to delete the file system, screw this shit. <laughs> <laughs> we can make it available. I'm not encouraging you to put this in the home directory of your coworkers, just to be perfectly clear. <laughs> I am not encouraging you to do this. Don't, don't. <laughs> yeah. All right, talking about delivery, um, the worst 
thing I've ever seen, or the, the most anger-inducing thing I've ever seen as a pen tester, which means you should totally do it to people who are trying to attack you, is like rate limiting and stuff. Generally, anything that you're doing, because you're trying to do things quickly, unless you're like a complete savant. I know people, and I've got a little bit of it now, where you know, you're like the, the website whisperer. You look at a website, and you know what's wrong with it. But most of the time, people are going to be running tools where you're iterating over stuff. Um, if someone's opening a lot of connections to your web server, if they're the top talker to your web server and they're not a customer who's logging in, then yeah, maybe think about rate limiting them. It's the most annoying thing in the world. It's like really cool. But yeah, find ways of slow talking um, or alternatively just sandboxing their stuff through. But stuff like this, um, you've got to tweak the number a little bit and you probably want to inject a little bit of latency, but that is a IP tables rule that will put random drops into a packet stream. So you're not blocked, you're not denied, but just things aren't working right, like the machine at the other end sort of unwell, which most people will just go, you know what, stuff it. Um, I've got a file with all of these commands and stuff, so you don't need to quite do the OCRE thing on your phones. Um, but yeah, so think about slow talk, think about looking at people who are making too many connections, but once again, be careful to make sure you're not blocking legit stuff. When you look, always just look at your top talkers on your web server. Uh, my wife was running a game forum thing and we found a server that had done 32 gigs worth of HTTP traffic to it. Um, presumably it was a spider that got itself caught in a loop and just had been going for I don't know how long. Um, but maybe that's something you want to do. That's awesome too. Um, I've seen it done if you are running something like Spam Assassin and you know people who actively send you spam maybe put the TCP window size down to like two and maybe drop some packets. And because, uh, you know, if you're okay with using up a few threads, tying up a spammer for the next six months, that's probably okay as well. Um, it's pretty cool. I mean, it's petty, but well, I don't think that's a bad thing. I mean, you know, if it makes you feel good, if you're annoyed on a Friday afternoon, you go, you know, I'm going to mess with the spammer's shit. I reckon that's a pretty good way of going about it. Um, exploitation. Um, exploitation is quite often quite visible in terms of the way people do things. Uh, yes, this guy's very happy because he managed to get himself a root shell. <laughs> um, yeah, it's, there's lots of ways of exploiting things that are usually detectable. Um, for those who haven't seen SQL injection, I try and include this in everything just in case you're a web dev who doesn't know what SQL injection is because you should. Um, if you don't know about it, there's currently a Turkish kid who's just defacing your website using it, so don't. Not to generalize, I mean, but yeah, there's like people all over the world where they're basically in terms of defacement like it was in the US in the 1990s. US, US kids are all hunting bug bounties now, whereas there's certainly parts of Europe where defacing stuff for the joy of it is still a bit more common than it is doing it for cash or, you know, anonymous, basically. Um, SQL injection. A SQL query will generally look like so, which is fine. One is provided on the, it's part of the URL. But then when someone chucks in a, union select or whatever, then it means that you are fetching a bunch of data that you didn't intend to return. So always escape your variables, make sure your numbers are numbers, parameterize your queries and so on and so forth. Um, by the same token, if someone is sending you HTTP traffic with uh, things like union select in it, maybe you send them to another web server. I'll talk about some of that stuff later if we've got time, but I don't think I will. Um, Meterpreter, this is the best way of annoying, particularly legitimate pen testers. If, if you're in a, a blue team role and you've got red team on site, look for port 4444 in your network. It is the default uh, Meterpreter phone back for the Metasploit framework. So all of its traffic is talking in that. So like, look for 4444, catch it, send it somewhere, I don't know. Do random shit to them, find their desk and stand over them. Any of these things, yeah. Most people don't change the default because they don't have to because people don't look for it. But if you see 4444 on your network, that's a bad sign. And Meterpreter is, uh, yeah, Metasploit's basically a, a bunch of exploits that are very easy to run. They all have a very standard interface and that's sort of generally what they drop is the Meterpreter. So most people in a pen test engagement, they're also known safe. So most people who are particularly red teaming you, you'll see Meterpreter just because they're not randomly downloaded exploits from the internet. And yeah, easy to spot. Uh, installation. Messing with installation I find hilarious. Um, yeah, it can be pretty precarious for people. Um, things like 
doing mount, messing with mounts and permissions. This will mess with people trying to deface your crappy little website for who knows how long. So basically, you install the UnionFS package, you make a actual worldwide web directory that you put your files in, that you mount a writable one over the top of it that's not the original one, and then whenever anything's put in it, you just sort of move it back out of the way. So if someone's writing to var www, it just like goes, oh, something's there. I'm just going to put it somewhere safe. I'm going to send you an email. Um, and they'll be like, well, where'd the file go? But I put the file there, particularly with a little bit of a time delay. It's a pretty effective way of uh, messing with it. But uh, the file's a bit, oh, someone deleted it. But I just, oh. Yeah, you can bind it with something like the thing before, like the, the Python Metala, or like a PHP equivalent, where there's always a syntax error, and you can keep someone tied up for weeks. <laughs> um, containers are really cool. Uh, they're not generally intended, and even the people from Docker will tell you that containers are not intended as a security control, but they can be a very effective way of keeping people separated in your environment, or you can drop them in a container. Um, C groups and all that stuff is pretty damn handy to try and compartmentalize things you're running. Um, think about, if you are running containers, think about going to the next step and running, if it's supposed to be, I always get to it, idempotent or whatever, you know, if it's a container that's not supposed to contain data, make it read-only. Like, why do you need to be able to write contents to a container that is supposed to be read-only? You're not supposed to be patching it, you're writing a new container. So think about doing things like that. Um, also, be careful, use IP tables and stuff on your containers so they can't talk out. It means if so once someone gets in, it makes it very hard for them to pivot. But consider doing this stuff to avoid that installation problem. If you're constantly blowing away and bringing up, like I've heard from the guys that run um, Heroku at Salesforce, it's like, if a container gets compromised, like they generally don't even see it. Like by the time they know about it, that container's already been torn down and a new one stood up from the good source, because that's just the way that their deployment system works. So if you're running things like that, there is effectively no persistence, there's no installation. Not to say that you shouldn't secure yourself, but it also just gives you that extra step of protection. Um, command and control, that is a VNC for the Remy Martin plant, unfortunately still exposed to the internet. Uh, <laughs> I checked that the other day. Uh, found via Showdown, I think. Um, but yeah, look for, like, command and control is whatever someone's using to control in your environment. You do see a lot of VNC out there still, unfortunately. Um, when we're talking things like point of sale compromise, which unfortunately is still a problem in Australia and other places, it's because the command and control used by the people who service the terminals is VNC. And yeah, you know, they have a, a password for all of their customers. Someone gets one of the passwords, they use the password on all the other customers. All of a sudden, everyone's credit card numbers are in the wild. Um, things like SSH. If you see SSH coming in and out of your network, where it shouldn't be, or going to sites that, should, that aren't whitelisted, I don't know, maybe man in the middle of it. I've never seen anyone upload their own like key to check the signature when they're first using SSH. It's usually a... Has the thing I'm talking to changed? Most people just go, yeah, whatever, the first time they connect. So if you like do man in the middle of SSH when it's going to untrusted hosts, like, meh, you know, you could find some cool stuff. You could inject random keystrokes into their stream and mess with this. I don't know, you know, any number of ways of doing those things. Uh, RDP, all of these things. Um, look for them in your traffic, slow them down. Maybe you do want to deny them. At this point, the point you're blocking command and control is the point you start panicking though, so you know, it's not really like a tool around with people stage, it's more like a panic and alert, the CIO and the media team. Actions on objectives, uh, that, this is basically where you get money, like, or whatever your goal is, or fame, or you know, it's some base human thing generally that is the action on objective. How do I get the cash? Um, this is an example from a 419 scam. I don't think this is the exact image, but we did a hunt a while ago, a friend of mine and myself, and we went and found all the images included in 419 emails, and we looked for geocoding in the images, and we managed to find a number of locations where these are, you know, boiler trunks full of cash are located. Um, it's a lot of fake US $1 bills, as I recall, but there's a significant amount of effort to, like, you know, it's a typical thing of, I will send you this cash that we got from the last one, so it was like, Colonel Gaddafi runs a honey mine or something in our country and we want to get the cash out, so 
But yeah, CEO emails. Um, I've got a demo that I may not have time to get. Like a, if you can have like a fake payroll person, but when you're, sorry, when you're, people in your organization get an email saying, hey, I am currently trapped in you know, dollar country and I need money, or I am your boss and you must pay this invoice, having an email address that you can have those people respond going, um, I can't help you, but John over here can. And meanwhile, you know, you're John, and you can go, all right, no problem, so I can put it in the system for you. Can I just get the bank account details for that one? Oh, no, that didn't work. Maybe you've got some other bank account details. Or maybe some other ones. <laughs> maybe Western Union. Oh, but you've got to sign up for this other website that we've got. Um, I've got a bot that basically just does that, and it's annoying as hell. <laughs> like, <laughs> and it, it's no cost to you, and like, you can just put, I, I don't know whether they realise whether it's an English language problem or not, but you can put some really stupid stuff in the emails, and people will be like, yeah, no worries, that sounds good, here's another thing, but, you, ooh, I think I dropped out there. Um, you can basically... Uh, milk all of their accounts, forward them through to the police, and maybe someone can do something with it. So you can do a public service as well as just being vindictive, which is always a goal. Um, main thing is just don't reveal your mechanisms. Um, this goes back, to, I guess, to a transactional model, and I still see it occasionally at banks. Like, if someone goes, okay, I put the transaction in the system, it should always go, yep. And then, like, no money comes out but why didn't the money come out? Did they get ripped off by their money mule, or did the bank stop it, or the other end stop it? Like, you know, for them, it's like, you know, like the underpants known from South Park, you know, collect underpants, something, profit. They don't know what the something is, so you should never reveal it. You should never go, no, you can't move money to here, or, oh, that's too much. I mean, unless it's a legitimate customer, in which case it's useful, but don't reveal the mechanisms. Don't reveal where you're detecting them if you can. Just... If you run a transactional system and someone orders a camera and you know that it's using a stolen credit card and going overseas, just give them a receipt number and then throw, you know, just drop the thing on the floor. Like it, yeah. Otherwise, I'll just work out a game, uh, way to game your system and work it out. SQL map. Uh, SQL map is generally the go-to tool for pulling data out of a SQL database. It's really smart. It has a wizard and stuff. Um, as I outlined earlier, it can be a really funny thing to take SQL map, unless they use the random user agent option, will set the user agent to be SQL map. You can just chuck something in your Apache config so you send it off to a fake database. Um, I made a little one that just basically gives them a user table from WordPress with some Regastly lyrics in it, but, you know, <laughs> that's all easy to do, you know, it's just, yeah, you, you're basically either going to, you know, upset or amuse someone, but yeah, whatever you want. You don't want to go into your live system if it's got SQL map in the user agent. Counterintelligence. Um, I will make it available and provide links. I don't have it currently on a public git, but um, the Cowie uh, Honey Pot, which is uh, like, it's basically a fake SSH server and bash that if you like guess the right password, it puts you in a, a virtual system that's not really a virtual system, it's just like a virtual command line. Um, Kippo you may have seen as well. Um, we've got a modified version of Cowie that also pulls out the public SSH keys from the people who are connecting. Um, you can go and pull the public SSH, sorry, public SSH keys from GitHub users. Um, I saw this, Filippo, I think the guy's name is, who first sort of talked about this. So if people SSH to you and you get the key, then you can go and find who that key belongs to on GitHub. And a lot of people have GitHub keys still. So um, it's a fantastic way of conducting counterintelligence. You actually know who it is who's messing with you instead of it being like a handle. It's like that's where he works for his day job. Um, but yeah, look at what you can gather. Look at the way you can link things. Things like cookies. If you give someone a cookie, then like have something in your logs that gathers that cookie because then you know that that's the same person. Basically find ways to link people together. Forget about IP addresses. Anyone trying to sell you IP address reputation is just stealing your money. It's not useful. Um, pretty much anyone with any vague clue will have a way to get an IP address in Australia um, and or potentially using the actual victim, using a victim's IP address to get to you. So it's even worse than useless because you're discriminating against someone who's also a victim. Um, so yeah, try not to do that, but think about ways to get counterintelligence. 
Uh, I've got a bunch of credits, but mainly thanks to Flickr for providing really high quality images and all the people who post stuff on it. Um, I, all of the links to the tools I mentioned are in that their Google shortener with a really, really easy to read <coughs> shortened URL. Um, yes, questions, thank you. <laughs> Questions? We'll start with questions, and if we run out of questions, then we'll go on to thoughts and feelings. G'day, Kane. Thanks Hello. for the talk. Um, just a very quick, just a very quick comment about um, killing logs off. That, that's good if you're not an ISP, but uh, if you are, then you may be stuck with data retention. So you've got a problem there. Um, Emails the, the 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 universal evil at the moment for all of this, and I've noticed that uh, across the, um, the the hosting planet there is a proliferation of on-site WAFs. Uh, how effective are they? They are very effective against the bottom eighty percent of people who might be attacking you, which is realistically like ninety-nine percent of the people attacking you. It's a if deployed in the right way, they're a very effective countermeasure. It won't stop someone who's really good, but it'll delay them long enough that they'll probably go on to another target unless you're like strategically targeted, which is super rare. If you sell oil by the barrel or export coal by the billions of dollars, then meh. Otherwise, if you just run a website, it's probably pretty cool. A lot of the stuff about hiding errors is great um, for stopping attackers, but it also messes up life for your users if they do something wrong and, and they can't understand why. Yeah. How do you handle the, the support problems that you get from that? If um, you have... But it, well, if it's like an a input error, like, oh, you didn't put your mobile number right or something, then that's one thing. If it, I mean, you should never block, like... Ask anyone with a name like, you know, O'Loughlin or O'Flaherty or O'Reilly how they feel about, you know, input sanitization on surnames. Uh, I had someone from a very large consulting company say, no, you just can't use an apostrophe. And it's like, uh, my boss, Miss O'Loughlin, would like to tell her that she has to change her name. And they went, okay, maybe we can fix it. But yeah, it's things like that, yeah, but otherwise, if it's just like blatantly bad, just throw it away. And, and always catch error 500 messages or error 400 messages on your like load balancery thing and just say something went wrong please try again um, don't ever actually spit the real message because it lets us play with things and work out what we did wrong cool um, what's your feeling on sort of counter-attack i've heard of um thing systems where you if you've got an ssh shell coming in then you get a back channel and you can you ssh back into that person's machine and do bad things to them. What's your feeling on that? Um, I mean, if you assume that the person at the other end isn't another victim, then you're probably making a very grave misstep. Um, I have certainly heard of, I don't know whether they ever went to court, but I have heard of people effectively seeking damages because someone else basically hit them thinking that they were the criminal infrastructure when they weren't. Um, plenty of times someone's website gets taken down for being a criminal hosting thing when they had an old WordPress plugin, which is not, as far as I know, criminal. Um, yeah, like you just don't know who it is at the other end. I mean, if you really, really know who it is, like send goons to their house if you're that serious about it. Like don't, like electronic countermeasures is just going to be, you're probably talking to, you know, if you're in a situation where you're legally equipped to do it, then you probably got all this stuff sorted out and your in-house counsel and whatever or your ASD, you know, legal counsel are dealing with it. But otherwise, I think it's a super bad idea because you're probably just screwing someone in the same situation as you. So, if you have limited time, uh, turn it off, turn it off, off <laughs> On the side, I think, yeah. Turn it on. If you have limited time, um, on my web server, I got tired of dealing with all those attacks from mostly China, I'm afraid to say. Mm -hmm. uh, like, just they actually, when I started blocking their bots that were doing God knows what, they started saying, Oh, I'm MSIE. Mm -hmm. And they would 
keep changing IPs all over the country until I ran out of time and I just said, where's your net block? I'm blocking your whole country. Uh, that took care of my problem. Of course, there's actually some good people in China yeah. who are trying to write docs and things that I write on my website, which can't get to them anymore. Um, is there someone who maintains a list of net blocks that are not countrywide, so I don't have to do it myself? You can definitely block by country. I cannot recall the RBL off the top of my No, no, I, I can't do it by country. I'm doing that currently. Oh, sorry. But okay. I'm punishing people in China who are not bad mm. people, of which most of them are not, obviously. Yeah. Uh, so is there people who've done better, smaller lists of the people running those bots pretending to be browsers when they're not and crapping all over your robot TXT and actually yeah. looking at that as where they should go scan instead? For there instance. are definitely things for like CMS platforms where you can block people who, like say for example, blog spam, you can block the IPs of people who've posted blog spam elsewhere. But I mean, for things like posts, maybe you just don't let people comment from certain places. Uh, it really depends particularly in a corporate setting, it's sort of a bit of a trade-off. It's a bit different when it's a blog. Ultimately, I try and run everything I can on, like, static content. Right. Like, unless you have a very active comment section that's not about Rolexes and Herbal Viagra, quite often as having, you know, having something that produces static content, like I think it's Octopus and a couple of other things. You know, you write your blog, you hit the go button that makes the HTML. I'm actually doing that too, but... Yeah. So there's no RBL kind of list of bad IPs... There are some, but I question the value of them considering how quickly people pop new ones. Right, fair enough. Okay, thanks. We've got okay. I'm afraid that's probably all we've got okay. time for today. If you have any more questions, don't hesitate to talk to him afterwards. Um, on behalf of the Linux community, I would like to say thank you very much for your Cheers. time. Cheers. Cheers.